Hi, um, so I'm here to introduce Shane Meadows. Uh, my name's Becky Rogers. I'm one of the producers of um, This Is England 88, which is coming out soon. We just uh, screened the first episode of After Last Night, which went down very well. A lot of it was shot on the Sony F3, so Shane's going to talk to you about that and his use of Sony cameras. So we, um, we screened the first episode uh, on a cinema screen last night of This Is England 88. So although I'd seen the Sony uh, footage intercut with red uh, footage in the edit suites and in the grade, we never graded on a monitor any bigger than about 27 inches. So although I thought it held up uh, very well, I never really knew um, quite how it was going to stand up, obviously, until we blew it up. And I'm, my expectations were slightly lower because when, when I got the camera in, uh, I think it was March, it just come out, the um, I didn't, the S-Log uh, update wasn't available at the time. So we just basically, I, I was going to use it as a B or a C camera uh, alongside that I could shoot. Because as a director, I, I've also operated a, a lot of my early films and um, a film like the Duncan Scorsese, I've been the cameraman. Um, so I didn't want to shoot everything, but I wanted something that for myself, we always shoot with two reds <coughs> on the last two series, and I thought I'll have this extra camera. And we shot at the on the internal codec, the 35 um, megabits per second. And, um, and, you know, so my expectations were it'll be okay in, in you know, in small chunks or, or whatever, and maybe when the S-Log comes out, we could possibly use it as an A camera further down the line. But then when we started handing stuff to the DIT, and blowing it up in the van and, and looking at it, it seemed to be for that, um, the, for, you know, for, for basically what the format it was recording to on the XD cam was phenomenal, really. And, and so last night, weirdly, I watched it, it all together. And, and as the shoot went on, the Sony went from being a kind of a B or a C camera to basically being involved in every scene in every shot. Um, and we had a three camera shoot, basically. There'll be the odd time because of handheld for reasons where you needed a 360 Vista that we didn't uh, have more than one camera. But basically the Sony ended up being used far more than, um, than we were all anticipating. And, and like I say, I watched it last night and it was completely seamless. I mean, to, th to think that the red originated obviously at RAW um, and then came down to 2K and then was, we, we watched it on a 2K screen at BAFTA last night. And I swear on my life, it, it was completely seamless because I'm, a bit of a tech head and I read all the forums like a lot of people and you see these 300% blow ups and people are going look at the noise but when you actually sit and watch something on a cinema screen it's a completely different experience and uh, and you, you know it was it was incredible and that was that was a, a the basic bottom end resolution and so I was I'm just about to embark on um, my next film is actually 90% confirmed maybe 95% confirmed it's going to be a a feature length documentary with the Stone Roses covering their reunion and kind of going leading up to their, their concert and, and and now I've seen what the Sony F3 can do and seen it blown up, I've, I've decided I'm going to shoot the entire thing uh, on Sony F3s with S-Log and, and maybe a Samurai or something at the other end um, you know to get the latitude because it's going to go into, it's going to be solely for the cinema and then into TVs so it's kind of uh, yeah, it's, it's exceeded my expectations really, and my background, I've been waiting for a, a camera like this, I know the 5D came out and I was really excited about the 5D, but because I'd got used to the, the video camera form and the, the, the sort of XLR inputs and this, I, I know you can get great stuff with those things, but I was always really frustrated and the, the massive depth of field that you got with the 5D because of the size of the frame, meant focusing was you know I couldn't kind of work in the way that I'd always wanted to work and so it's with the advent of the Panasonic AF101 the new Canon that's coming out obviously no one's really seen anything from it yet I think is it the C300 and with the Sony F3 that there was um when I first started making short films I remember going to a, a, 
a film festival that was local to me in Nottingham and saying, um, I've made a film on video. It was on high eight. I mean, I started with really, really basic, I, I can't remember the name, it was a Sony VX1000, I think, back in 94. I think it was a VX1000. And, um, and this, I got rejected from the film festival, not based on the fact that the, the film was no good, but just based on the fact that it wasn't on film. And they said, we, you know, we don't show video here. And I was kind of like, but do you like it? And they went, yes, yeah, brilliant. Um, and so I set up my own video film festival in 1994 in Nottingham. And I remember at the time thinking one day, the expense of film and, and the kind of cost and the hierarchy that's involved will be available to me and to people like me who are trying to make films. One, you know, and I, I sort of imagined about 15 years ago a camera in the, basically I imagined the sort of AF101, the, the F3, something that was affordable within, you know, within reason. And I'd imagine in the next few years they're going to come into the, the price brackets of the three or four thousand pound versions. I know there's an FS100. But I imagined a camera like this about 15 years ago and it, when it happened this year where filmmakers like myself can get access to 35mm motion picture kind of quality uh, in a package you know, like that, um, and what's happened is all of that's kind of come true. You know, the snobbery sort of surrounding film and the expense of film has gradually been whittled away with the advent of, of high, def high definition cameras. And and the brilliant thing for filmmakers like myself, as funding has disappeared quite badly in the cinema and, and TV world, um, but the brilliant thing is now um, to realise ideas 15 years ago with no money, it did look cheap, there was no real way around it. If you were shooting on high eight, you could do the sort of short films I was doing, but it was hard to craft anything incredible that, that looked really incredible because you were bound a little bit by your budget. But I think you know you only have to look on Vimeo and, and some of these sites of what people are doing with Canon 7Ds, 5Ds, you know, and, and all of these Zakuto shootouts and all of these things. It just it's really been a remarkable, and, and for people that want to actually uh, work on the on the floor making these things, there's no excuse now not to make something that can't be shown in the cinema, and you know for for, for very little. And we last night had some 7D footage in in the in this is England, um, and obviously the F3 and the Red, and the 7D. To be honest, you could tell it was a digital SLR, but but even. Uh, on that cinema screen last night, it was completely seamless from a raw codec on the red to a 35 megabits a second. And I was astonished actually, I was because I was looking for it as well, because I'd always thought, thought, I wonder how this is going to compare on a big screen. And in the rest of the world, This Is England 88 is going to go out in certain countries as a film to be seen in cinemas and will be joined together. Um, so that was massively kind of reassuring for me. And, um, and you know, I'm a bit of a Sony fanboy in so much as I was one of those that had a VX2000, you know, because of the low light capabilities and the PD150. And I've shot maybe a hundred short films on those two cameras. So I always wait for the Sony camera to come out because I've got used to it and I like the sort of shape of it. But I, I have tried out every sort of other version of cameras that are out there. And if something's better, I won't just stick with Sony because I've grown up with the Sony cameras. Um, but yeah, the F3 has been. Uh, remarkable for me because I've been waiting a long time for a 35mm sensor in something pretty much like I used to shoot with when I was 21 making crap make films with my mates you know the, the idea that someone who's is me now who's starting out could pick up something like an FS100 um, and, and get that scene you know it kind of in cinemas all over the world is incredible because musicians have always had They've always been able to, um, if you're a musician and you've written a song, you can play a great song on an acoustic guitar and it sounds great. And you can buy an acoustic guitar for 10 quid. And film isn't quite like that. You know, film is bound a little bit by, you know, having a crew, having a sound man, and, you know, and to make stuff look great. And that gap's now closing. Um, and, you know, for people that, like myself, that come from, you know, I'm, I'm from a pretty, you know, normal working class kind of town. And it was a very unavailable thing to me. Um, 35 mil, 16 mil technology, and now, you know, with iPhones, all of those kind of things, that gap's closed enormously. And so I just wanted, you know, to come here today really just to sort of obviously share my experience with you of the where I was at with the Sony F3, what I'm about to do with it, and just if anyone wants to ask me any questions about anything to do with 
the current stuff, all my, my old work or anything, then uh, I wanted to sort of open it to the floor, really. So you can ask me whatever you like. I was up late last night drinking, so uh, when my producer's disappeared. Uh, he didn't go back to his hotel room, uh, so he's vanished off the face of the earth. Uh, but I'm here, so if you want to ask me any questions, um, obviously it's an open floor and feel free to, to do so. Okay, so he just asked me um, if I was doing it again now, if I was starting at this point, you know, making my short film, how long would I wait for funding? What would I, you know, I mean, I mean basically the landscape is pretty similar again now to how it was for me, because I, there's kind of, there's these little fluctuations in particular in the film industry where budgets come and kind of go. There was a big period in the late 90s where all the American companies like Miramax and everybody moved into the UK got offices in London and then when things went bad they just pissed off back to America and left everyone high and dry you know and it's um, and so you have to work within those undulations a bit in the film industry uh, I I'm sure there's people out there that you know have got scripts in with people things in development projects that you're waiting on dream projects you've been sat on someone's shelf you've been turned down for funding you've maybe received some funding and then they've forced a producer on you or they've forced a cameraman you didn't want you know and I, I I applied one great example was I made a film called Where's the Money Ronnie or I was trying to make a film called Where's the Money Ronnie one of my very first short films and uh, I applied for some local funding uh, in Nottingham but I'm, I'm not I, I basically left school a year early I got no qualifications so it, when it comes to filling out forms writing synopsis of my what I want to do I'm quite shit at it really and I'd sort of go you know the, the ideas just didn't some people are amazing at form filling you know and it's like people you know you see on websites about cameras they can break down a camera they can say it's better than this but, but you know as a lot of people always comment on these forums you know at the end of the day if it's good and it's you know five percent less resolution no one's going to give a shit you know it's got to be good first and foremost uh, obviously you want the best kit you can get and all of that but I I really suffered when I was starting out because I wasn't able to uh, fill out forms in a way that you know that so they read my application and just kind of went that doesn't sound very good and it didn't sound very good and they gave the award to somebody else it was about 15,000 quid I think at the time um, which to me was like you know, I was living on the, on the dole so that was like millionaire stuff you know and the guy that they gave my funding the one I was applying for the guy that got it went to make a, a documentary in Nigeria and didn't come back um, so he took the 15 grand and, and literally didn't return and so I, so I carried on making my film I made it for about 200 quid and uh, I shot it on high eight um, and I shot it on you know literally boots high eight at the lowest I just got the cheapest stuff I could get made the film anyway and I was working as a volunteer in a film center and uh, this guy used to let me edit on I was working on high band machines so it was literally crunch editing there wasn't non-linear at the time so when you made an edit you were working through one edit at a time you couldn't go back to the beginning and kind of go I'm just going to change that but you had to go back to the beginning and then carry on from there again so it was it was really um, quite a different sort of setup and it wasn't very liberating and so I was making this film and all the people that were in it came one night to this little edit suite and they were all watching the film and laughing and, and the guy that had uh, given out the funding was walking up the corridor and heard these people laughing and he looked through the window and I didn't know who was there and he watched the film that he'd rejected by me that I'd gone off and made anyway and um, he tapped on the window and I come out and he said look I'm in a bit of a spot here mate he says I know I rejected your film I've just watched it through the window it's brilliant um, the guy who got the money that you would have got ran off um, would you pretend that uh, I gave it to you and, um, and I'll give you two grand to finish it and I said, you bet, yeah, I'll do anything. Um, you know, well, does that mean I can put titles on it? Does that mean I can? He said, yeah, yeah. And, and so he, I helped him out of a spot. It got me, I knew I was going to get a TV slot on the sort of local TV station. And it was like half 11 at night, they were called First Cuts. And so I had to pretend that I'd had this fund. And, uh, you know, and I did it. And in exchange, I got some titles. I got an online and a sound mix. And that was the first time I'd ever done anything. I just used, used to either edit and camera 
or crunch it on these machines and I suddenly got a chance to improve the sound, put some tiles on them and then I entered it for a competition and Stephen Woolley was one of the judges in this competition and uh, and I got a, you know, my mates are real shits with a wind ups and I come in one day into my office and I've sent this tape off about six weeks before and there's a message on my answer phone, a really posh lady's voice, you know, Hello, I'm calling from New York on behalf of Stephen Woolley and you know, we've seen your short film and shown it to Liam Neeson and I was going, who's this? And uh, so it, there's a New York number to ring back. So I ring it back and I'm expecting, you know, gay prostitute line or something like that. And the same woman's voice answers. And it's genuine, like Stephen Woolley had seen this short film and had uh, and said, you know, Derek Malcolm's on the board and there's other judges, but from my perspective, you know, you have to win this competition. There was a five thousand pound prize, and, um, and, and and you know, to cut a long story short, I went on to win it, and uh, I won the five grand. I got the five grand. I put straight into making small time. Digibeta came out the, in '95, and uh, I hired a Digibeta camera for ten days. Used the five thousand pounds to buy a boom, some cables. Went to Aldi, got about two hundred quid worth of shopping, and shot it. And so. To answer your question, and I know I did it in a very long way round, <laughs> if I'd chosen to wait for another fund, I wouldn't have made any of the films that I've kind of made now because the chain of events was such. I mean, it's not always like, it's not like, oh, if I go off and do it, then a producer's going to ring me from Hollywood. Mm. But the actual chain of events are very real for me in that situation. So by going, I don't care that you haven't given me the money and I'll make it better just to cheese you off. You know, it's like, I made it um, anyway, and although I would rather have made it on Betacam, I shot it on High 8, and it got projected in a big cinema in London, the night it got awarded, and the chain of events was such that a year later I was shooting a feature film with Bob Hoskins and made 24-7, and it was a complete turning point in my life, and, it, and a lot of it came from being brave enough to kind of go, um, you know, I'll just use what I can get my hands on and I'll still make it, and um, so, you know, for that, particular point in time I'm like massively grateful and and I, you come across whether it be people who've got scripts or whether it be people who've got film ideas you come across people that want to and people that do and the people that moan and the people that do you know there's just a, there's a group of people out there that they might you give them a million pound and they won't be happy and there's people out there that you know would like a million pound but if they can't they'll make it for a hundred grand you know when we did Dead Man's Shoes uh, we just basically said we'll see how much we can raise in six weeks because Paddy's concert on the actor was only available at this point so if you can raise three million great you can raise hundred thousand pounds and we'll just make the film for that because you can always always find a way through and um, but the, the diff the big difference now is that you can go off if you don't get the funding if you don't get the help you can potentially go off with some of this this new generation of cameras basically and it isn't like Where's the Money, Ronnie, where it, you know it's got a very limited life because of the format that it's shot on. If you're shooting on these cameras that are available now, and you can get access to those, um, whether it be 5Ds or whatever, there's still that potential of a cinematic release everywhere. You know, which is that's the really exciting thing about now is where, although it didn't stop me doing anything, those films do look very dated and do look, you know, whereas with what's going on now, and you look at the quality of stuff that's floating around. That people are making without crews by themselves, single man shoots. Um, some of it's breathtaking, and um, and the format is really helping that. So, anybody else? Did you shoot your first feature with without distribution? Chap just asked me if I shot my first feature film with or without distribution. Um, I, I'd never had distribution in place on any of my films until Dead Man's Shoes. The way it was was on 24-7 Romeo Brass and Once Upon a Time in the Midlands, and the way it's, it's quite common in the film industry, that you make your film, you get it sort of financed, and, um, and then you go to festival or you go to market and you try and sell it. You usually take on an agent who goes in like you know for 10% or something like that, and they sell it on your behalf. So if you're very unknown, you tend to take on an agent that maybe hasn't got a lot of swing because you obviously you're not that well known and um, and then if you're in that position like I was in the early days it really comes down to your film if people at festivals pick it up I was going into festivals 
without a prayer. You know, I went to Venice, and, uh, and obviously no one had heard of me. And uh, I went to the Venice Film Festival, and it won the jury prize. And it went from being a black and white film that no one would touch with a barge pole to suddenly winning a jury prize. And the next day, people are dropping cards through your door. Have you got distribution? I'm interested for so because if they see in what all that matters to distributors, uh, exhibitors, is if they see an audience watching something, that's living proof of what people will think of your work in some capacity. It's not like what everyone around the world's going to think, but if people are laughing their socks off through something or crying through, they can kind of, so in a way, no matter what they think, they may think something's abysmal, but if an audience tells them it's not, they'll still buy it. If they think something's amazing and an audience don't like it, they won't. You know, they, they're not risk-taking people in the, in, in the general sense of the thing. So, I used to go out on a kind of guerrilla basis with every film and sell it and, and show it to people, but it always came down, you, no matter how well you spoke about your own work, it just came down to whether people liked it or not. Um, and, um, and your track record becomes really important because 24-7 uh, didn't make any money. Uh, Romeo Brass made even less. And so then funding's like almost obliterated by the fact that you haven't made any money. And it wasn't until Dead Man's Shoes started to make a bit in the cinema and then This Is England took off and I think it sold like 1.3 million DVDs that now all of a sudden all the doors are open and because it's just number crunching. So you know, as, a, as a, an artist, if you like, a director, I'm bound by my own fashionability. It's like if I'm in fashion, I can aim for the stars and if I'm not in fashion, I have to make the Duncan scores easy. You know, it's kind of, you know, I'm either making something for 30 grand, but and I think this is what directors produce. Certain people have very unreal expectations of the market, you know, and it's kind of like, if things are down, you have to learn how to go down with it and still make stuff. And uh, and sometimes, you know, making, a, making something for a lower budget can actually be really a really good thing, you know, because having too much money and throwing too much money at problems and too much equipment can take away from the drama as well sometimes. So Dead Man's Shoes, we had, 700,000 and I sort of said, look, let's forget trains, let's forget jibs, track. I'm going to have a tripod and I'm going to have handheld. And it was such a simple decision, but it ends up becoming so effective and it was a financial decision to start with. Um, you know, so I've always worked pretty much within the reality of the market at the time. Yes, mate. Uh, he was asking what I thought of the Scarlet, and I'm, I'm hoping... I've got a, is, is there one here? No, there's not one here, because I was hoping to have a look today, and I wanted to see the new Canon that was announced and stuff. No, um, I mean, the Scarlet, that, <laughs> I suppose it's... I, I've, I follow the websites like everybody else. It, it was literally announced when I was born, I think, wasn't it? Yes. Um, and so, in a way, it's, there's a bit of a negativity attached to it, because obviously a lot of people who are, wanted to go out and make documentaries and stuff, I think, were hoping there was going to be a two-third inch version and, and so what they set out to do obviously changed but I think as a camera in its own life you forget the history of the nightmare of how long it's taken to actually appear uh, it looks really exciting I think I think from my perspective I'm not a big one for for my own personal camera for having to add on too much I like something to come pretty much that if you want to shoot with it at that size you know it's got a screen and, and I think uh, and I don't know too much about the scholar but I've always found with the red cameras <laughs> when I look at on This Is England, we shot the first time I used it on This Is England 86, I sort of saw this body and went, that's really tiny, you know, how great's that? And then they brought it onto set with like a behemoth lens and once it was all put together, I was like, what's that? Where's that thing that was in the box back there? And like, that's like buried in there, look, and that's the rest of it. Yeah, on This Is England 86, we used 7D in some of the fight scenes and red, and then 88 is basically F3 red and, and a tiny, tiny bit of 7D. Um, and for the Stone Roses documentary, um, I'm hoping to use uh, two F3s, maybe a, an EX1R, but I'm hoping there's a new one of those coming out before I start, but I don't, I don't know whether it will or not. Um, and then, you know, these new, um, really portable, like, Nex cameras, because I want to get stuff of the band, like, literally, in places, really unorthodox places, but try and keep that depth of field, the 35 mil depth of field, so I won't be using any tiny cameras for doing any major handheld movement work because of the, the rolling sensor, you know, the CMOS uh, problem. Um, but so I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm always incorporating smaller cameras, but I, you know, in terms of the big interview stuff, the main stuff that you'll see, it will be 
uh, F3s with S log, I'm probably looking at the Samurai or something like that because I don't really need 444 because the file size is you know, gigantic. But I probably shoot it at 422 to help the grade, and the jobs are good, hopefully. Yes, mate? You'll have to pass it down. <laughs> So, so, could someone who can hear just shout it down? How quickly did you have to on the Ah, cool. So, how quickly did I act on the Stone Roses thing? It was, I was about, about three weeks ago, I was driving to a film festival to go to the airport to a film festival in France, and um, someone had told me Ian Brown had been trying to get hold of me and wanted my number. And um, I've spoken to him a few times, and you know. I know him a bit, and, 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 and he had my number, but I change it regularly, so I uh, sent my number through, and I got a phone call in this taxi, and uh, he told me the Stone Roses are getting back together, you know, and I was just like, obviously, they're like my all-time favourite band, and so uh, the first thing I said was, if you let anybody else film it, I'll kill you. I hope you ring it to ask me to film it, because I, I have to do that, and uh, so I was kind of like, I mean, they, you know, from my point of view, I'm not a documentary filmmaker, um, but obviously Scorsese is kind of one of my heroes and the way that he, because of his love of music, will go and make documentaries about musicians and can do it because he's a filmmaker. Um, I'm hoping that, that applies to me and it's not rubbish. Because, um, uh, you know, I'm, but you know, like I say, it was one of those jobs that I just said I have to do that. And I was planning to make a, a big feature film in the summer next year, like a, a £10 million feature, but I've just pushed it to the side literally just so I can do that. Uh, which I could be here in two years with a fucking cap in hand, <laughs> regretting it. Uh, but um, yeah, so I, I acted incredibly quickly. And um, although it's not completely signed off yet, you know, um, I'm, you know, fingers crossed. It happens. So. Yes, sorry about that, mate. Yeah, I, I've used the. Uh, I, I did some. I tested it recently because I was doing the because it auto focuses. Um, I tested it um, when I, the Stone Roses asked me to go and shoot the press conference. So I got an AF one on one because the F three. I didn't want. I didn't know what was going to happen on this day at the um, at the press conference because the F three is completely manual focus, and I was told I literally would have to operate myself and. Um, I just thought to myself, I don't want to take the risk of the first thing I shoot with them being soft in places, and so I needed an autofocus camera. So I tried it um, at the time, and uh, actually it stands up. It's a, I, I love the form of it. I know a lot of people like. I know it looks weird. And I love how it looks. I think it's a beautiful little thing. Price-wise, it's incredible. But it was like on the actual autofocus side. Um, just purely from a technical standpoint of view, it sort of hunted either side and it wasn't a very natural drift into focus for me. And I know most people won't use autofocus on it, but I needed something very specifically that I could run and gun with on the day. And I was shooting it myself on my shoulder. And when I was doing tests and stuff, I found it would drift past and pull back to something, which felt very mechanical. It felt like it didn't feel like a, an operator was doing it. It obviously was a little servo doing it on the camera's behalf. So um, had that been better, I probably would have shot the first day on that, but I ended up doing it on an EX1R just because the auto. I found that I tried a Canon X F305, which was amazingly fast at auto focusing, but just not good enough in the low light because the, the conference was in this really dark room. So the EX1R got the call simply because the autofocus was pretty good, but it was just brilliant in low light and the autofocus looked a bit more natural to my eye. So I did test with it um, and it nearly kind of you know got called upon. So. Price-wise, I think it, it's pretty unbeatable, really, a bang for buck. Yes, mate. Yeah. So, what decision-making process goes on to use which format of camera? Um, I mean, when um, the, the main reason to move from film to digital came about because as a filmmaker there was a thing called a ratio uh, that doesn't exist in digital world which was the film ratio if they the insurance company know your project's meant to be 90 minutes that a ratio starts to develop based on what you're shooting every day on film stock and I had I had the highest one 
ever with this insurance company was like 170 to one about two weeks in and the, and the cost of film is all you know there's a cost per reel to develop and obviously they're looking at it going you know this is absolutely insane and they try to maybe shrink that ratio down to something more normal um, and so part of my reason for wanting to jump to digital was because it wasn't restricted like that it wasn't like you weren't financially bound obviously you need hard drives and things and more of that so there's certain cost implications but it's not like a thousand pound a reel or what, whatever which was insane at the time so the reason i desperately wanted to go from 35 and 16 to digital was for creative reasons so that i could shoot more material without having people ringing me up saying i had to stop doing it um, and then when it comes to um like when we shot the fight scene and this is england 86 where the guy turns up who's the, the funny guy flip and he turns up to you know to sort of pick on sean and um it, it was just a simple case of getting those extra things that you kind of you know you've got two cameras but i'd set someone up with i think with an ex1 7d running around in there so you, you've got an extra body running around amongst it um, but you're getting those kind of cameras can do things because when you've got someone with a shoulder mount here there is obviously certain you can't literally take it off your body and turn it under someone's face you can't you know there's a, there's a certain physical restriction although you're handheld and you're quite liberated little cameras digital slrs can do things that those bigger units those rigs can't do and can get to places that they can't do and in used in moderation in, in the cuts you tend to find that it's pretty seamless when you look at when i look at especially handheld footage from digital slrs uh, it's not very forgiving on bumps and you know and it, so you have to pick and choose obviously where they do shine is when they're on tripods you look at 5d films that have been made reasonably static but it's pretty smooth handheld stuff they're, they're amazing but um so i've always sort of found that when i'm looking for shots in high octane sequences like fight sequences and things like that but that's when you call in and so whether it be these next cameras or whether it be gf2s or you know if it, a GH2, sorry, um, in the Stone Roses documentary, I'll be because I can get them stuck on a cymbal looking down at a drummer's drumstick or at the end of a guitar where you wouldn't want to use a main camera, you know. Yes, mate. Um, yeah, I, I suppose it, um, if you have conflict with the DP over, I, I suppose it does happen. It's happened with me in the past with people that I've worked in where, because I'm quite into my technology, um, you know, I, I've had you know, moments where you have disagreed about, you know, in the early days I was just blown away that I had a motion picture camera. You know, I've been gone from high eight to a 35 mil rig and I was able to sit on a crane and I was like, yeah, I felt like Alfred Hitchcock floating about, you know. So that, I, I never asked a question. I just was like, went in the cinema, watched it blown up, watched rushes, black and white rushes. I felt like I was like on the set of Raging Bull or something, you know, it was like, blew my mind. And then obviously as, as the time goes on and you learn yourself, you know, you get to a point where you become a bit more educated and you kind of go, well, you know, that was soft, that one. And they go, no, it wasn't, you know, you have these little things. But the, the guy that I work with now, Danny Cohen, is a bit like me, he's, um, he's a, he, he, he always knows the cameras that are on the horizon is just as excited about what's coming as what you're using now so he's as much it's like a sort of two children in a sweet shop thing he tells me i remember when the minima came out the little 16 mil camera and he shows me shots of how someone used a camera and he's really excitable and just as much as i am so but at the same time you know you kind of what i've learned the first time i used a red if i'm honest was a bit of a nightmare technically the heating up um, the camera was just a nightmare. It was a pig, honestly. It was an absolute pig. There was a point at which the DOP got a hammer to smash it up <laughs> because it just was so unreliable. Um, it looked not you know not picture wise, but actually because I was shooting in council houses and you know um, it was heating up really badly and uh, overheating. And then with all the upgrades and even through the course of the shoot some firmware things came out and it literally improved over a six week period and then when we used it this time around it was a completely different story um, it was pretty seamless i think we maybe had one or two crashes in an entire shoot which is no different than having a lock up on a film reel where you get a hair in the gate or a jam on a mag you know you have to accept certain things um, but uh, yeah so the long and short of it is is that you know he's just as bad as me and uh, it's probably the producers that try and stop us 
hiring in every camera known to man and trying to talk people into sending us over prototypes of stuff. Because um, I, I got really excited about a, a really small company in Sweden that were making a new Super 8 camera and it never went into production. Um, they're called Iconoscope, I think. And I was like ringing them saying, you know, please make it. You know, I'd love a little new Super 8 camera that I could use. So I'm a, I'm a sod for it, you know. But luckily, so is Danny. Yes, look. Yeah, uh, I mean, my relationship with music and composers uh, had always been really, initially, um, when I first started making short films, I had no idea that you ever had to clear music because none of my films were being seen by anyone. And it wasn't until I, um, Where's the Money Ronnie was going into post-production where the, the um, Central TV rang up and said, have you got the clearance forms for for this um, Booker T and the MGs track and for this Aretha Franklin bit and, and the Paul McCartney track and that. And I went, uh, what's the clearance form? And they said, well, if we put this on TV, you'll be sued for about six million quid. You, can, you, you either. So I wrote to them, you know, I, I blindly thought they'd watch the film, you know, Paul McCartney would sit and watch it and go, yeah, that's fine. Obviously didn't. And uh, I had to change every single piece of music on there. And um, I'd made about 60 short films that I can't release because I could change all the music on them, but they wouldn't be what they were. So I've got all of these films where I didn't get an actor, a location agreement. I literally just made 50 or 60 short films without one single bit of permission. That I, you know, unless someone, you know, unless I, I, mean, I don't know how I can get them to be seen. You know, not to make not to make money off them for myself, but I just literally can't physically unless you come to my house. Um, I don't think they can stop me doing that. If you drink red wine like you can in France, um, you know, I um, so I, I had this thing where I had a really rude awakening, and um, and so when I made 24/7, obviously I've learned the ropes a bit by then, and I found out that with the music that you want to use, you go to the record companies way, way before you finish, because you need to know that if they know you've already put it in and you've finished the film, they've got you over a barrel and they'll charge you. I had a Van Morrison track on 24-7. They went to his lawyers. He's uh, famously difficult to get to clear music for, and uh, and he wanted 180,000 pounds. His people wanted 180,000 pounds to use the track. And so, um, you know, we. The only way round it was to send the film to his house, uh, and he was he was one of them people that if he actually liked something, he'd, he'd change the price himself, and he watched it and, and let us have it for virtually nothing, which was so like I, I learned such a lot on that first feature film that you know you can make music can make an enormous difference, but sometimes you're bound by the the fact that an artist doesn't like their music on something. So for the first few films, I never really had composers. <coughs> And it wasn't really until This Is England, the film, that I started using. I used Ludovico Iannaudi, and that was the first time. I, I mean, I went, I flew over to see him in Milan, and I was using stuff off his records. But then he was the first person I think that truly uh, wrote something for my film. Was, there was a guy that did some stuff in the Midlands, but I, 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 I wouldn't class that as something I was ever happy with. The first time I was happy with anything composed was with Ludovico Iannaudi, and so now my work is. I've got a slightly wider palette now. I can know. I know I can call on composers, but I'll, I don't think I'll ever get away from using tracks that I love. I, I can't. I kind of grew up in a house. My mum was into Motown and soul. My dad was into rockabilly, rock and roll. My sister was into um, sort of new romantic stuff in the eighties, and I was into punk and skinhead music. So it was like the four stereos playing in that house. I can never get away from. It, it was burnt into my soul a bit. So I, I'll always, always have a eclectic musical sort of approach. Um, but I try to do it now based on what's needed, you know, so. Yes, mate. When you were starting out, um, were you more driven by your passion to you, uh, experiment film techniques or the passion to tell a story? Was I, was I inspired? Well, were you driven at the beginning to uh, experiment with film techniques or were you more driven by the need to tell a story? Okay, yeah. He was just asking whether I was, when I first started, whether I was driven more by the film technique side of actually, you know, so more in, in the filmmaking side or, or actually telling the story. And it was it was absolutely the storytelling side because the first film I made, you want to see the eye lines in that baby. I mean, it is unbelievable. 
You know, I mean, it's like, so, you know, that character's in a front room, the other character's in Jupiter, where are you looking? You know, but they made them funny, in a way. It looked like I was trying to be clever, but I hadn't got a clue. So I was crossing the line, you know, I did everything possible. You know, a very wide shot, intercut to an eye. It was like, I was abysmal, um, and, and I learnt my craft a bit more as, as the years rolled by, really. So, uh, my work had a charm. It didn't have any technical ability to begin with. And that, that came gradually later, and I learned to appreciate that the two do go hand in hand, but I'll always be a storyteller first, I think. And, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm one of them people, if drama's right, um, you can stay on one camera, you know, you can just stay on one shot. If a scene's amazing and it's working, so I always start with the actors and believe in the performance, and when I believe the performance, everything else gets added afterwards. Um, I'm not one of them that goes, you know, let's pull a this isn't working, let's pull a track out, let's do this to make it work. I kind of go, no, this isn't working because it isn't working as before. I'm not going to try and fix it with a clever camera move or a crane. I've got to make, I've got to believe this first and then everything else is all gravy, if you like. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the, so the transition from directing Friends to directing, obviously I went from, I made small time for a few thousand quid with a, like, with a group of mates on the same street. Yes. There you go. Help. What's he done? Um, yeah, and, and I went to meet, the, the big difference, I was really lucky that Bob Hoskins was a really, really nice guy. And with some of the actors I've met over the years, it could have been a, uh, it could have been a very different experience because I've met some not so nice people and some really nice people. And so I went to meet him. Yeah, I was. I mean, I'll be honest. I was absolutely petrified. I've never been scared of anything in my life that way. I, and I was walking into funding bodies, going, "Oh, you know, I, I, I can make this." I believed in myself so much, but then all of a sudden, when I went from shooting it myself, I realised I'd been really safe because I, when I'm making those films myself, no one's funded them really. Self-funded movies. No one has to look at a really crap call. You know, you can basically only release it or show it to anybody, or just don't show it if it's really crap. But when you've someone's giving you a million and a half quid, I, you know, honestly, I was ill with it. You know, I, I think I had an ulcer at the time. I remember walking onto set and wanting to run away because I. Would, it was like I'd been. I hired a transit van for small time, and that was it. We just all got in it and all got out of it. I walked onto this set, and it was like trucks, people saw in wood and, you know, carpenters, you know, Mary and Joseph wandering around. I was like, what is this? You know, and all these people that were looking to me to run the show, and I absolutely bottled it. I was, I don't remember the first day. I just don't, I can see the first shot, I don't remember being there. I was that scared. It was like, you know, because it was gigantic. And, um, and so that trend, but, the, but like I say, with the help of obviously Bob, Bob had seen Where's the Money Ronnie, Steve Mully kind of believed in me, you know, after the first couple of days I started thinking I can actually, can do this, you know, but having 50 people working for you, um, from having, from, from that, a little weird little terrace in the middle of Snenton in Nottingham to suddenly that, it, it was massive, um, and, but you know, a week in obviously I got it and I was a, you know, a bit better at it, I had a very nice crew, because you can have a crew that can destroy a, a first time director if they want to, um, and you can have a crew that are kind. And I was really lucky that I had a kind crew that let me get through the rubbish bit where I didn't know what I was doing. And they all kind of supported me. I've, I've seen people crumble with a bad producer or a bad DOP or a first that isn't supporting them. You know, if you don't sort of believe or give your director support, you can crush somebody. And that could have crushed me quite happily. That first week, someone go, what on earth are you on about, mate? You know, I, I, I might have just gone back to what I was doing and not thought. So I was really fortunate, to be honest. I think, yeah, I've got time for one more question, so if anyone wants to ask me how tall I am, or five, six. Yes, mate. Could anyone relay that? Okay, I mean, I think um, if you want to make your, your first film, Aaron, I mean, obviously, the stuff I talked about earlier on, which was um, if, you, if you're getting rejected everywhere, try and find a way 
to kind of make it. And obviously, if it's a feature film, that's a big undertaking. So maybe it's create a ten-minute teaser. Maybe create. You know, my attitude was I can't get into a film festival, so I'm going to create my own one. And, you know, obviously that you know doesn't always work, but having that kind of appetite really helps. Um, and I think the other thing is, um, for a first-time director, I would say um, to do something from the heart rather than something that you thinks. You know, as I've seen so many people with their first time ideas that are copies of other ideas, or really, really, like, you know, I'm going to make a science fiction, you know, and I need, I can do it for 10 grand. You're kind of going, you know, whereas it's like, if it's a two handle, or it's sort of trying to bite off something that you actually can chew is a, is a big thing. And I mean, at the moment, I've got maybe seven ideas that are all in flux, and I think a lot of young producers and directors I come across have been pitching, walking around with one idea for maybe two years, and if your idea just falls into a period, say it's a horror, and that horror thing's just out of, or say it's a football factory type thing, and everyone's bored to death of it, and you've just missed the train, you need a range of work to take around with you, I think, and that's one of the problems. I remember it myself, I wanted to make Where's the Money, Ronnie, I couldn't think about anything else, I had nothing else up my sleeve, um, and I, you know, if I hadn't gone out and made it, I'd have been just wheeling that around till today, you know, and... And it's kind of like, so I think as a producer and a director, that's really important. And I think one of the key things, a really massive thing, which I've seen happen a lot at local level, is where a kid will get funding and he'll have a producer and he'll have people that he's been working with on his own films. And then the people that give you the money say, well, you can't, we'll take you on and we'll give you some money, but you have to use this producer. And they change everything about you. And that, at the time, you see people go, oh, that's okay, if I have to, I have to. But they don't realise how pronounced an effect that has on the filmmaking. If you've come through with people, it's a bit like the X Factor when they say, I don't like the band, but I like you, and they go, oh, I'll audition on my own. Um, sometimes those people are really important, and they might not be as technically great as another producer. They might not have the experience, but they maybe know you and make you feel comfortable. And that can be massive. That, that I've got a family in warp films and a family in the cast of This Is England. And it's really difficult for other people, they can't break that down, you know, and it's really, really been paramount to my work to be, to choose people by personality rather than by CV. And I, I just took on an editor, and me, uh, the first editor we did the first episode and it kind of stopped working and I auditioned some editors and I had people with massive experience, big CVs, and a guy came in that had been editing Central News and that's what he'd done. And I just said to my producer, I love that kid. He, I think he's going to be amazing. And he's just edited the last two episodes of the series. And he's probably the best editor I've ever worked with. And he was editing local news. So I, I've never, ever, with actors, I'll take on someone with no experience and I'll do it in crew as well. If I like someone and they're like-minded and they've got that appetite and that passion and they're tuned in, I'll take them on at any stage. And I think sticking with people that you trust is vital. Okay, thanks ever so much everybody.